you know april and i were taking this trip and we had it all figured out right we were going to go do these things these great things we're going to do we're going to glacier and go to yellowstone we're going to go to exactly this what we're doing while you're turning there yellowstone glacier mount rushmore custer state park all those things over there with us and be great because we're going to do it on labor day right right when all the kids go back to school <laughs> try again now all, all the parents that are homeschooling are taking their kids out there for the field trip yep that's right <laughs> All right, Romans 5, verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet for adventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So we've been working our way through this. We've seen the issues that Jesus died for us when we were without strength. And it, that issue there, he says, he, what does he say? Uh, when we were yet without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly when we were without strength when we couldn't get ourselves out of our predicament right there's nothing we could do that, that talking about that sin nature right where everybody's born with that sin nature when we were still living in that Christ died for us and he calls that at that point the ungodly I don't know where you are not aren't I it's okay for the ungodly and then he goes on and he talks again sinners right when we were willfully sinning sinning we made that decision. You have a sin nature, right? We, we do sins because we have a, a sin nature. But we also, then there's the issue of being a sinner, making the decision to do that sin. Because it, it makes our, our flesh feel good. It makes us feel good. And then the third example he gives there is what? When we are his enemy. Mm -hmm. Willful disobedience. It, it wasn't so much about, well, that's just who we are. It wasn't so much about, well, it makes my flesh feel good. Nobody's going to tell me I can't. So you see the three, the three he, he gives there. Christ died for those people. Christ didn't die for the people that are perfect. Christ didn't die for the people, we'll see in a second, that are righteous and good. Christ didn't die for the people that don't need a Savior. He didn't die for the people that turn from their sin, make him Lord of their life. He does it for the ungodly. For the sinner and for his end it's a fantastic uh, display of God's love we, we showed earlier in, in verse 5 it talks about God's love is shed abroad in our hearts mm -hmm. well these next few verses here they demonstrate God's love for you and we're gonna get down probably not today probably next week and talk about the atonement and we'll see well we have received the atonement one time yep and there's the issue of national security <laughs> Okay. <laughs> national Too much security. politics on my mind. It's not an issue of national security. It's an issue of eternal security. You're eternally secured. That's what chapter five demonstrates here. You see, there's when in, in this in this little few verses here, he you see the different different people. Look at verse seven. There's a righteous man, there's a good man, but then there's a sinner. He says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Right? Somebody might die for a righteous man. Right. Might, might trade places. Right? That, 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 that man, that person is so important, is so good, is so, is so righteous. We just can't be without that person. Kind of sounds a little bit like the thinking that you might have with the Antichrist, right? And some business people might die for that. But most people won't because most people are happy to see the righteous man fail. Now we're talking from human viewpoint here, right? Yeah. Think about how many times, and, and it's a silly little example. It's not really just any means. You guys go back and think about um, Martha Stewart. Mm -hmm. Everybody loved Martha Stewart until she got to the top. And for, she got convicted for, uh, in my opinion, a silly little thing. But boy, did people love to watch her fall. Yeah. yeah. They loved to watch her fall. 
We, we love to see a righteous man fail, so maybe you put, uh, people won't die for a righteous man. But for a good man, eh, a few people would die. That's what, that, that's what that verse is saying. But will people die for an enemy? No. No. Will people die for a sinner? No. They're not worthy of my death. No. Yeah. The city we live in, the metro area we live in, they won't even speak out against a sinner. People won't give any credit to a sinner. People will even say, will go so far as to say, that person can't be a Christian because they live such and such a way. Even other saved people will judge other saved people. But that verse says that Jesus Christ died for who? The sinner. The sinner. The enemy. Not the guy in human good. Not the guy that's trying to be righteous. Not the guy that's trying to be good. The sinner. Look over at 1 Timothy 1. First Timothy 1, verse 15. Because this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am chief. Who did Jesus Christ come into the world to save? Sinners. sinners. Yeah, sinners. So that's everybody, right? How many people have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? Everybody. Yeah. But when somebody says, and this is a, this is a big issue in the world today, that sin, sin doesn't exist. Sin is just mankind trying to control people to not do bad things. If you don't believe you're a sinner, you can't get saved. Christ didn't come to save, to die for you. Now, I'm talking about in your own mind, okay? Right. But my son says everything is a learning experience. That's what I don't know. If everything's just a learning, I don't mean to pick on your son, but if everything's just a learning experience, did Jesus Christ come to pay for people that go through learning experiences? No. Yeah. That's why whenever when we talk about when you share the gospel, when you share the gospel, one important element of that gospel is that you are a sinner. If you don't believe what Jesus did on the Christ, cross, you're going to go to hell. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can't tell people that. You better tell people that. If they don't believe it. Nobody ever got saved from hell. They didn't know first they were going to hell. Right. That's right. We call it fire insurance. We have a little fun with it, right? But that's why that's part of the gospel. You got to convince somebody out of the Bible that they're not good. There is not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. By the way, there's your definition of sin. Fallen short of the glory of God. That's how much Jesus loved you at that moment. Right. That's when he died for you. We looked at the thing in Malachi last week, right? I'm sure we no, did. I don't Where think the, we did. The, in Malachi 3... The begotten son? Yeah, where, where the, 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 father, the father will spare the son that obeys him, that serves him. Yeah, I mean, you could... I'm getting some blank faces. Yeah, Look, I know. Come with me to Malachi 3. Malachi 3 and Romans 8. I don't think we did that last week. Yeah. Malachi 3, last book of the Bible, or the Old Testament. <laughs> Malachi 3, Romans 8. I would suggest you write this in your book. I, I think these two verses, to me, show what a great, awesome, loving God that we serve. Look at Malachi 3, verse 16. This is going to be a prophetic passage talking about this time out here. But there's a, there's, there's a neat little thing in here. Verse 16. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him, and for them that feared the Lord, and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. And I will spare them, as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Okay, what does that verse say a father will do to a son that serves him? Spare him. He'll spare him, right? If a son's, yeah. son serves his father... The father will spare him. 
right? Come with me to Romans 8. Romans 8 and verse 32. Before we read that, did the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son, serve the Father? Yeah. Completely, right? Not only out here, before the beginning of the world, all through here, but specifically in his earthly ministry, he completely relied yeah. on the will of his Father and the, and the Word of God, right? Yeah. Okay, we've seen those morning Bible studies that they had, and not thy will, not my will, but thine be done. Romans 8, verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? The verse says that the son serves the father, the father will spare him. Jesus Christ served his father. That verse says he didn't spare him. Why? Because of the love for us. To deliver him up for who? Us. For us, for you and for me. And then it goes on to say, how shall I not also give you freely things? All things. You see that you, you see that comparison though? The prophecy says, hey, if he serves if he serves the Father, the Father will spare him. But God the Father and the Son loved us so much that he didn't spare his son, but deliver, delivered him for us. You can see that was the plan all along. Begin to understand the depths of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you go read the rest of Romans 8 here, you're going to come to the conclusion that nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's the what we will learn in those last few verses of Romans 8. The issue I'm trying to bring home is the love of God and lay down the, the basic elements of the issues in Romans 5 of our eternal security. That we never again, once we're saved, have to worry about judgment, about uh, eternal destiny spent in the lake of fire. We were talking about this at the truck stop today. A gentleman was there and asked, yeah, but don't you have to be careful with that? And then, of course, we'll go to Romans 6, right? What, you know, Shall we sin? God forbid. Because if you're not in jeopardy of this, well... Why, why should you do good if you're not in jeopardy of that? And that's a common question. And it's, unfortunately, with human nature, it's a legitimate question. And then the answer is, of course, because that, that's not who you are. And we won't do it tonight, but we'll do it whenever we get to Romans 6. You start to find out who you are in Christ. That's not who you are. Don't live like that. If you're dead to sin, how can you live in Why do you live in sin? Right. Doesn't, even, doesn't even make sense. Right. Right? Why would you do that? And, that, and that's the issue he, he lays out there. Back over in Romans 5. In verse 9, he says, I love this. He doesn't just say, you know, there's more. <laughs> Tom, well, some of, most of you guys won't know who this is, or you two won't know who this is. Remember in the middle of the night on your TV? Tom Peterson. <laughs> but wait, there's, there's more. There's more. <laughs> wake up. Wake up. Yeah, wake up. There's more. You guys are going, who in the world is Tom Peterson? <laughs> much, not even just more than, much, much more, more than. You ever seen that commercial? But wait, there's more. We'll give you two. Get all done. But wait, there's more. We'll give you four. <laughs> I got, there's a song, you probably heard that too. Blue Lake Nicole. <laughs> I have, I'm sure I'm the end of it. I'm serious, it's on there too. Blue Lake, there's more. Much <laughs> more than. I tried to show you last time, you know, Mr. Stam in his book on Romans, he goes through and, and, and he says, you know, in verse 6, that's wonderful. And in verse 8, that's more wonderful. But you get down to 9 and 10, and it's most wonderful. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath. Now, let me ask you something. 
But at this time in Romans 5, should we understand that we're justified by the blood? Yeah. That's what 4 was all yeah. about. Chapter 4 was all about, right? Look at the end of chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 24 and 25. But for him, for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. We're justified by his blood. Mm -hmm. Come with me over to Ephesians 1, verse 17. Verse 7. Ephesians 1, verse 7. In whom, speaking of Christ, you guys hear me say all the time, understand who you are in Christ and go live out of that identity. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you want to do, do that study, the place you study, start that study is in Ephesians 1, and you go verse by verse through it. And just in Ephesians 1, you'll find out how much you have, so much of your identity. In Ephesians 1, verse, the, the, whole, the whole chapter there, you can just, you can spend all, the, you can almost spend your whole lifetime with studying Ephesians 1 about who you are in Christ. Mm -hmm. There's a lot it's there. Just, you know, yeah. It just gets wonderful or wonderful or and most wonderful. Verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Okay, we have redemption through his blood. He shed his blood on the cross for us. We'll look at a couple more verses on that in a second. Okay? That's how we have our redemption. Through his blood. Now that redemption equals for us the forgiveness of sins. You can't go to heaven if you don't have forgiveness of sins. Right. Several years ago, uh, there was a Supreme Court ruling about uh, gay marriage. And, of course, I had the answer. So I had a little 700-word essay on Facebook. And once I had spoken, that was going to fix the issue. We could just move all along. It was going to be great. <laughs> the guy sends me back a reply and he, and on that. And he says, okay, so now are you saying that people with their sins forgiven go to heaven? I had to read my article about four times to figure out what he was even asking. But there's a, that's a movement today that Christ forgave, that all sins of the world were forgiven on the cross. So everybody's sins are forgiven at the cross. But if you don't believe it, you're going to go to hell. What that means is that teaching will tell you there are forgiven people in hell. And that's not. Christ died for the sins of the world. He died for everybody. It's only imputed to you if you believe the gospel. Right. People do not go to hell with their sins forgiven. Right. I just want to be clear on clear on that issue. Romans 2 tells you if you reject the gospel, right, you are treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath. There's a, there, there's a movement. It's gaining, it's gaining a lot of traction anymore that everybody is forgiven. They just don't, it does not, they just, they don't know it if they reject the gospel and then you have forgiven people in hell. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. How forgiven are we? What's that verse say? Complete. to the riches of his grace. However rich God is in grace, that's how forgiven you are. And what's the verse say? Where sin did abound, grace did, did what? Much more. Much more abound. However rich God is in grace, that's how forgiven we are if we believe the gospel. Look over at Colossians 1, verse 14. We started our collage study at the uh, truck stop, and, and we're getting off to a slow start, but it's been a good study so far. Uh, Colossians 1, verse 13. Who, God the Father, hath delivered us from the power of darkness, hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have what? Redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Again, that redemption is in Christ and because of his shed blood. The reason I bring up this and I highlight these verses, in fact, you can go over to Romans 3.25. Romans 3.25. 
Bill probably knows more about this than I do. I haven't studied the issue out a whole lot. But the new Bibles are starting to take these, these phrases about the blood out. Yeah. The issue is the Lord Jesus Christ shed his blood for our sins. Without well, shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. It's the power, yeah, the power is blood. So we be very careful about that. If you have a Bible that takes the blood out of those verses, you need to think about what you're reading. Look at Romans 3.25. Exactly. I repeat that. Go back to Adam and Eve. Yeah, the question is, does, it was, is the blood saying a substitutionary death? Absolutely. Go back to Adam and Eve. Right, Adam and Eve, they sin. They come up with their man-made religion, right? Richard calls it Operation Fig Leaf. I can cover my sins. That's what they're saying. I can cover the, the shame of being naked. I can cover it myself. I can do some work. I can go down. I can harvest this fig leaf, I can put it together, I can assemble it, I can put it on and, and wear it. You ever worn a fig leaf? <laughs> no. <laughs> They're not smooth on the inside. <laughs> They're pokey. <laughs> We're going to move right along at this point. <laughs> We're going to move right along at this point. But, but isn't, that what, isn't that the way we do it? We can cover our sins, but right. there's all kinds of things poking us. Yeah, but you know, what about this? Yeah. What about that? It's not very comfortable. What did that man-made religion, what did Adam and Eve trying to fix it, trying to say, oh, I'm okay, in their own, God came to walk with them in the middle, of the, in the cool of the day. Shame. Couldn't find him, could he? Yeah. God knew where they were, understand what's going on there. But they hid. They hid. So what did God do? He, shit, he killed an innocent animal, didn't he? And covered them. Okay, now go forward. What did God tell Moses to do when he was going to take the nation out of it, out of Egypt? Kill an Sacrifice. innocent animal. Get the animal, inspect it, make sure it's without blemish. Kill it. Shh, shh, put the blood on the door on, on the, the door mantle. Right? Did the Holy Spirit care? Did when the when that Spirit moved across? Did, he, the whole, did the spirit look at the actions of the people inside, what they were doing? Or did he look at the blood? Looked at the blood. It was the blood. Go back and read that story with that in mind. It yeah. wasn't about those people's actions. Other than they put their faith. Moses said, look it, the destroyer's coming tonight. If you put the blood on the door mantle, you'll be fine. And they had to have faith in that. That's what they had to put faith in. Yeah. They put, they put their, oh, I don't get it, but okay, I'm putting the blood here because I think the blood's going to save me. And the destroyer came along, looked at the blood, okay. Go forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. Come back to Tammy's question, the substitutionary blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. What's the wages of sin? Death. Death. Physical death. Spiritual death too, but physical death is the wage of sin. And eternity spent in life. Jesus Christ shed his blood, like we have seen previously. Then you, the one I missed too was then there's all the sacrifices that Israel had. Okay? He shed that blood for us. So that he could, and we put our faith in his in that blood, we'll see here in a second. Then that is applied to us. Jesus Christ, through the shedding of his blood, becomes a substitutionary sacrifice for us. One time. Only had to do it once. Right? Every time in Israel, what, had, what happened? We'll see this when we do our Hebrew study. So I'm starting to advertise our Bible study. <laughs> <laughs> Little Madison Avenue there. This priest had to continuously do that. Right? That's one thing we're going to learn in Hebrews. The human priest had to continually offer sacrifice right. because people continue to sin including themselves right you go in on saturday you offer your th your your sacrifices everything's good you walk out you don't even get home and you know you're coming back next saturday <laughs> that's right hey we're not you know if that was us we'd be the same oh, we can't yeah. even get out of bed without falling short of the glory of god
Or was he? <laughs> yeah. No, just so Jesus. The, 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 Jesus sacri- the substitutionary sacrifice. Oh, look at Romans three twenty five, and get Ro- and get Ephesians one again. Romans three twenty five, and Ephesians one. Uh, let's see here. I should go back to Romans 3, 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no, be, there shall no flesh be justified in, in his sight, sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's exactly what happened in the garden. Adam and Eve thought they could put together this performance-based acceptance system, reclothe themselves. They were clothed with God's the, the light of God. Before, they sinned. They, they sinned. lost that rainbow around them. They lost that. They say, hey, it's okay. We, we can make our own covering. We can cover up. Okay? They tried to do it themselves. They couldn't justify themselves. For by the laws of knowledge of sin, they didn't have the law, of course. Verse 21. But now, today, the time we live in, the dispensation of grace that we live in, didn't start at the cross, it didn't, wasn't back here, didn't start at the cross, didn't start for a year after the cross. It started with the raising of, the, of, of Saul, the apostle Paul, we come to see that, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, yeah. being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets gave witness to who? Jesus Christ coming. Jesus Christ. Okay. Now it's being manifested without the law. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, not in Jesus Christ, but faith of Jesus Christ unto all, that righteousness is available to all and upon oh. all them that... Believe. Believe. See, it's upon you if you believe. It's available to all, right. but it's only upon you if you believe. For there is no difference. The difference there is between Jew and Gentile. Verse 23, for all of sin come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this, this time, time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. God set him forth to be a propitiation, a fully satisfying sacrifice. Isaiah 53 says, God looked down on the, on the torment or the turmoil of his soul and was satisfied. satisfied. I need your your plug because I need to watch. Um, keep interrupting myself. God set him forth. That's why Jesus Christ came. Jesus Christ came to save sinners, and that's why God the Father sent him to be a propitiation, a fully satisfying sacrifice through faith in his blood. Now, initially, it was for the sins that were past. We've looked at this. It was for the sins that are past. But now Paul tells us, okay, he can be just and the justifier in which believeth in Jesus. Okay? Okay. If blood's not shed for your sins, is God just to, to not hold you accountable for them? No, he is just. There needs to be a penalty for right? the sin. One attribute of God does not violate another attribute of God. His love does not violate his justness. Right. The wages of sin is death. His justice has to be satisfied. Okay. It was satisfied here at the cross. We believe, we believe that the shed blood of Jesus Christ was the I can't say that word, the substitute for us, because God believed that the blood was enough. Right. So now, now God is just. Our sin debt has been paid. Now He can justify us. He couldn't justify you. Could declare you righteous if your sin debt hadn't been paid. Could He? No. That would not be just. Right. If he just said, you know, Dorothy, she's a pretty good person. I'm going to justify her. That wouldn't be just. But then what about all the other people that were as good as Dorothy? Or maybe just, just, just fell a little bit short. Or maybe a little bit better. See, God's, ju- right. God's justness would be violated at that point. What I want you to see in that verse is where it says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. That is not our faith in Jesus' blood. 
That is God the Father's faith in Jesus' blood. God, and I'll show you, I'll show you in a second. God sent his son. And when God looked down and saw that shed blood, he said, that God said that blood is enough to pay the sin debt. Now we are encouraged to agree with God. Come with me over to Ephesians 1, and you'll see it play out. Ephesians 1, verse 11, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who work of all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, that's the God the Father, who first trusted in Christ. That verse says God was the Father, was the first one to trust in Christ. Mm hmm you that rhymes up with what we read over there in Romans 3.25 through faith in his blood. Say again, God has determined that Jesus Christ's blood was enough to pay the sin debt. Do you agree? That's what faith is. Yeah. Believe in what God, the message that God has for you today. How do you know? That Jesus Christ shed blood, that he died for your sins, was buried and rose again for the third day. How do you know that that's enough to pay your sin debt? Because God's word says so. you got a document, a written document, that God says that's the case, doesn't it? Don't you? So sometimes that other verse gets, met, gets messed up. But yeah, this, when Jesus Christ died there, that's what the blood, the blood is. The blood demonstrates, if you will, the substitutionary death for you. He took your place on that cross. I think we looked last time. We saw. Let me see if I can. Go ahead and go back to Romans. Yeah, I don't. I don't have it. We we, we saw that in, in, in Romans when we were without strength, and we we went back and we in the. And I don't have the references with me today. I'm sorry, but. Back in Psalms, when we saw that sin binds people up. Right. And then we went, we looked at Jesus Christ on the cross. Right? He's on the cross with the two malefactors. They can't get themselves down off the cross, can they? No. They're up there. Why? Because their sin, their sin has bound them to it. Did Jesus Christ have any sin in him? No. It was my sin that bound Jesus Christ to that cross. He could have got off that cross at any time he wanted to. The other two couldn't have. But he was being faithful to God the Father's he plan. Was, but he, he yeah. was taking the, the, my place on that. And you see the difference in those two, Mallory, right? One, one condemns him, one doesn't, one blesses him, okay? But so yeah, we, don't, don't ever let anybody take the blood out of the issue. The blood is the issue. He shed his blood for you and for me. God believes the blood is enough. The Father believes the blood is enough. It's like in Romans 6 where it says, Reckon ye also. Yeah. You know, Reckon ye also that the blood is enough. Because God thinks it is. You ought to think it is. Okay? All right, we're back in Romans 5, aren't we? Mm -hmm. This issue, verse 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. In one of these studies, we spent, I guess it was our Colossians study, we went through the issues of grace and peace. This is a time of grace and peace today, mm -hmm. right? Often it's taught, well, that, that's, just the, that's just Paul's way in the Greek and in the Hebrew of saying howdy, right? Just this is way, you know, peace, peace would be shalom, where, where do we are. It's so much more than that. This is a declaration, not so much from Paul, but from the Holy Spirit and from God of the time in which we live. Yep. It's a time of grace and peace from God, not a time of wrath. Should it be a time of wrath? Yeah. Absolutely. Now, if things had gone the way prophecy had said it, we would be into the kingdom by now, by the way. 
we'd right. be actually past the thousand years of the kingdom, right? Yeah. You'd have seven. You would have had seven years. You'd have a year here, seven years here, and a thousand years here. So that's more than. But this is a time of grace and peace, not a time of wrath. Right. When Israel... The next thing on the prophetic schedule after they stoned Stephen would have been right. the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. And, and that's, go through and study that's what Israel was looking for. What's with, that? That's what Israel was looking for because they were preparing to go through the that's wrath. Right. So to hear to hear Paul say that we are saved from the wrath, it's like, wow, that's de that's totally Absolutely. different. Roman, we went through this yeah. with the gentleman in the truck stop. Romans 15, 8. Uh, Paul says, Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. Romans 15, 6, he says, I'm a minister of Jesus Christ for the Gentiles. Jesus Christ is preparing this group over here to go through the tribulation. Right. Paul just told you if you're saved, you're not going through that tribulation. Those are different yeah, things. Yeah, totally. I believe, and I don't know this, because when you hear this story, you've heard a million times. I believe that's one of the issues that caused my grandmother to, to curl her Bible with her own tears, is trying to understand, wait a second, how can he prepare me for the tribulation? And Paul says, we're not going through it. That's different. The answer to that is rightly dividing into the truth. That's right. That will clear up that confusion. Being saved, you're not going to go through that. I saw it just today. Sorry, just yesterday. Some prophecy preacher is looking at, they're getting ready to sign some, some something over there in the Middle East. And he says, that's it. Seven years, tribulation's upon us. Pestilence, COVID-19, that's a pestilence. I have grace people that have taken uh, COVID-19 and said the rapture is any day. Now, the rapture could be any day, but just because there's a pestilence doesn't mean the timeline's upon us. It could be another 10,000 years. It could be another million years. We don't know the times or seasons. You don't know the timeline. But according to prophecy, you should be able to look at those things and figure it out. There are people right now that are very scared. The end of the world's coming. I might on all of these things because they are starting to listen and they see them. You know what, guys? Nothing going on in the world today has anything to do with what's going on over there in Matthew 24. Nothing. And our hope is in heaven anyhow. Our hope's in heaven anyhow. That's how you know. You're not going through the tribulation. You're not going through that wrath to come. And we would be raptured out before, even if it was coming. Exactly. Yeah. We would be raptured out of before. Because that's, of that, because that's of that how verse. the grace people have, have done this. They said, well, okay, we're not going to go through it, but it's going to be any day, so the rapture's tomorrow. And I don't have a problem living like the rapture's going to be tomorrow. That's a great way to live your life. That's the way Paul lived his life. But don't sell all that you got. Don't think, don't give up living because it's going to be tomorrow, because it could be, or it could not be. We don't have a timeline. But if you're worried because you see pestilence and you see wars and you see that, that verse will help you Calm down yeah. in the midst of a messed up world and not worry about those things. And instead of focusing on, oh my gosh, am I prepared? Is this vaccine really going to be the mark of the beast? That's getting a lot of play yeah, now, I too. Know. Oh, don't right. take the vaccine. That's the mark of the beast right yeah. there. Take the vaccine if you want. Don't take the vaccine if you don't want it. It ain't the mark of the beast, guys. The Bible tells you that. Rightly dividing the word of truth will clear up that confusion. If you're saved, if you have put your faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, you got no part in that. Right. Amen to that. That's right. Now, we still read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because there's a lot to learn there. Yeah. But understand, Jesus is preparing those people to go through this. Jesus Christ never once told the little flock, don't worry, guys, you're not going through it. He said, you better hope it's not in the winter. You better hope you're not pregnant. If you see something, if you see the death... Uh, desolation of abominations oh spoken of in Daniel don't even get off your roof and get your coat run to the hills they're coming for you Paul says don't worry about that so what should you worry about right now today if we shouldn't worry about that we're going to go through the tribulation and, and, and the, the, the COVID and the, and the riots and all that stuff that's going on and it's not just in America guys there are stuff's going on around the world what should we be focused on Getting all men saved. Getting all men saved and coming to the knowledge of the truth. Our ambassadorship. Proclaiming grace and peace. God's not imputing sin to the world today. 
If you reject it, you're treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath. Your sins are not forgiven. You are not going to hell with your sins forgiven. And one thing, too, it's not grace and peace to the earthly things. This is on its own path. It's grace and peace to, to you, your soul. Yeah, it's grace and peace to your soul. That's the other thing. The prosperity preachers will come yeah. along and say, grace and peace. See, God wants you to be so full of grace and so full of peace that if you'll just live in a godly manner, if you'll just send me a hundred bucks and we'll <laughs> multiply it times a thousand, we'll get going and God will make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. You won't get COVID. I got a prayer for you here. Send me a hundred bucks. I'll send you a little prayer card. You won't get COVID. Anybody in your family got COVID, it'll go away. There you go. Lynn and Dorothy see it maybe not every day, but frequently. They get these people in from all over on the drugs. You know what? Grace and peace is also a time of suffering. We saw that, didn't we, in the beginning, early chapter, early verses of Romans 5. Tribulation worketh patience. Patience, experience, experience, hope, hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost God's given us. We spent weeks, seven weeks, I went back and looked, seven weeks studying those verses. The very first thing yeah. Paul tells you after he gets you saved is, let me tell you about tribulation now, guys. It doesn't mean God's mad at you. It means there's a way to get through it. It's going to work for you. So if tribulation works for you, why would God say, if you live godly, I'll take it away? Which he doesn't say, by the way. Did he? Well, that's not true. He did say it to these people. Right? Do what I say. I'll bless, I'll bless you. you yeah. Ignore my statutes. I'm going to curse you. Okay? He doesn't say that to us. He says, you've been blessed with all spiritual blessings. You've been, let me tell you who you are in Christ. You're accepted in the beloved. Well, keep your mind and soul. No matter what you do, you're accepted in the beloved. Romans 8, we looked at earlier, we didn't read the verse. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. And I know there are things I've done that I would think, well, man, there's no way God could love me. I don't even love me right now. And we all have those things. You know, we had a little car wreck this week. Little car wreck. It's not God mad at me. It's just... There's a thing in the road. Thing happens. <laughs> now, the, 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 the response is, well, how does that work out for a woman? Do we look at that tribulation, okay, God's mad at us, or we say, you know what, let's go through this. In a godly manner. Let's let this tribulation work some experience. Mm -hmm. And let that experience work some patience. You see how that's so patience the, first and then you wait, wait on the Did way. I get it backwards? Yeah. yeah. Tribulation, patience. Patience. Patience experience. And I'm known as being a very patient person, so that's an easy one for me. You actually did very good. <laughs> <laughs> Here I owe you five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I ran, I ran, I had, there's a, something in the road, I ran over it. And I thought we were going to be okay, it seemed to be okay, and then we got where we were going and it wasn't okay. But I, because I didn't have to turn on the gas motor, I could do an electricity, we got home, so it worked out okay. But, but that's not God mad at me. Right. And isn't it nice not to even toil over <laughs> trying to figure out why God's mad at me? It is interesting. It's this not is, even a part of our discussion. This is the first yeah. time in four days since the accident happened that we've even talked about is God mad at us, right? It, we, it, never it doesn't even, even come in our mind. It never even occurred yeah. to us. But Paul says we're not being justified. We're saved from wrath. Yeah. Now, the other wrath we're saved to come from is this. We're not going through the tribulation, but we also don't have to worry about this wrath. Right. Look at Romans 2. Uh, verse 5. Now remember, this is the same guy that is going to tell us verse 5. is the same guy that tells us over in Corinthians that God's not imputing sin to the world today. Verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Day of wrath. You need to worry about that. You don't need to worry about what's going to happen here because you're not going to be there. And that, and that gives you some you great, great peace. 
peace. You, know, you guys have all heard my story where I thought I'd committed the uh, unpardonable sin. And I was very worried about this. For three years, I'd go to that Rockaway conference, tears running down my face. And I was very worried about this issue right here. I got it, you know, right again, right in the vision, fix that for me. But that's a, if, if, that's a real deal. And there are, there, are, there are saved people out there. I will tell you this. There are saved people out there that have a pastor that's telling them that they're not saved forever, and they worry about that. And that's a shame. And that pastor is going to have to answer for that someday. Because five one says we have peace with God, peace being with saved. God. Yeah. Being justified, we have peace with God. I know several Christians that spend all their life toiling to keep God happy with them. That Bible study we sat at one day, I, I would say what I would say. And finally, at one point, one of the guys stood up. He didn't stand up. He, it was his turn to speak. He goes, you know what? I, I've studied dispensationalism, and I reject it. Now, at least at that point, I had never identified myself as that. But he could hear what I was saying. and knew, So I knew he'd studied it. But he says, and I will say this. I am scared of God. I am scared that when I mess up, God does punish me. And I, he goes, and I live that way. And I appreciated the fact that at least he was consistent. Mm -hmm. Now, he was wrong. Now, by the end of the year, he maybe agreed with me on maybe a little bit. Probably not. I have a grace and peace today, God. Yes. And we should be thankful for that. Absolutely. Yeah. Why, well, what do I have to be, you know, life's hard. I gotta work two jobs. I gotta go to this lumber yard and it just beats me up. I got COVID. My vacations are canceled. You know, my kids are just terrible. She's dating this one boy. I, he's a terrible too. And, and man, this is just horrible. You know what? I don't have to worry about this. Grace and peace. There's a, there's a way to start to be gratitude. I gotta get through this life, but then, and you know what? Paul also tells you how to get through this life. Yes, he does. Because you know what? You're also not appointed to wrath today. You don't need to worry about, okay, if I do this wrong thing, the wrath of God is coming at me today. However you want to define that wrath in relationship to God, you can define it and it will fit in that verse and it's accurate. God's not going to not going to pour His wrath out on you today. You're not going to go through the tribulation, and you're not going to be there at the day of wrath. You're going to be in heaven because that happens after the rapture. It's important. Yeah. This will change the way a saved person lives their life. Take them. We don't forget. We have not been given that spirit of bondage again to what? To fear. fear. We, again, Hebrews is going to tell us that there are people in the Old Testament that spent all their life living in fear because they didn't know that they'd done enough. Right. These are the righteous people. We don't have this. We don't have this issue today. That's why the other thing is you can't you can't look at somebody and tell if they're saved or not by the way they live their life. And we want to. We I, don't know, I know we like to judge people. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Well, okay, I did do that. <laughs> yeah. And I was saved. Yeah. We were without strength, ungodly, sinners, enemies. Let me ask you something. If there was somebody that always needed your help, an adult that always needed your help, oh. if you had somebody in your life that just that stole from you, took your car, took your money, mm -hmm. ate your food, lived in your house and did things in your house that you didn't think were acceptable. Who's your enemy? I don't like you. Came and showed up one day and keyed your car. What would you think of those people, that person? You got any love for that person? No. That's when Jesus died for you. That's the issue of forgiveness. I was joking. <laughs> it looks a little sad. <laughs> <laughs> That's when Jesus died for you. So let's think here. We'll go back over to Romans 8. 
that verse we all read. Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up, us, up for us all, how shall we not with him also give us all things? Yeah, I lectured you guys last week. I'm going to do it again. Somebody ought to be saying, Dave, you read it wrong. Oh, sorry. You left a word out. Freely. He died for you when you were his enemy. That being the case, God didn't spare his own son. How shall he not also give you freely, freely. all things? The all things is not money. It's not physical things. It's inside. It's the work he's doing in you. Right. It's all spiritual blessings. It's not appointing you to wrath. It's allowing you to go through tribulation in a godly manner and have it work out in you so you are able to use that to live a more godly life. He's given you a complete, finished, inerrant, perfect word of God that you can go find out about him and you can learn what you need to learn. He's given you the Holy Spirit that will take that book when you read it and study it, study it rightly divided, that spirit will work with your spirit and will change, will renew your inner man. How? Day by day. Though our outer man perish, the inner man's renewed day by day. He didn't charge you for any of that. We don't have time, but you know, Eve left that word freely out too. Right. Don't redo it. That's right. Freely give you all. You don't need to go out and work. Yeah, study that book rightly divided. Believe the verses, apply the verses, watch the Holy Spirit work in you. Be strengthened with might by in the inner man. It's God that's going to do the work in you, not you that do the work in you. And it's a good work. It's a good work. And if Philippians tells us how long is God going to do that work in you, you guys remember they went through Philippians with me? Until the till the day until of the redemption. Until the day of redemption. He's going to do that good work in you from the moment you get saved. All the way to the rapture. Yep. He's never going to say, okay, we got 75% of it. The last 25%, you're on your own. He's going to do that all the way to the end. Because he never leaves us. He never leaves us. And nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. If he did all that when you were his enemy, how much more will he do when you're saved? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, for your grace. For the wonderful free gift of our salvation. Believing that your son died for our sins, was buried and rose again for our justification. You declare us justified. You declare us righteous. You, you tell us we are not in jeopardy of having to go through wrath. That you will do a work in us. You will do that change in us that we so desperately need by consistently a daily intake of being in your word, day by day, responding positively to the conviction of the Holy Spirit as we grow up in, grow up into Christ, letting the word of Christ dwell on us richly. We thank you for the promises you've made for us, that we don't have to worry that you're mad at us, that you're cursing us, that you're pouring your wrath out on us that the issues in our life were already taken care of at the cross. And that you just want us to understand who we are in Christ and then use that as our motivation. To let, that, let us live out of that identity. That you sell us the love of Christ, that, that, that Christ's love for us, that motivation, that energy, that power to be transformed and to live a life pleasing unto you. And as we know that we are not appointed to wrath, that the signs and the times right now, Lord, do not necessarily point to the end of this age, that we should get busy in case it is the end of the age as ambassadors for Christ, proclaiming grace and peace, proclaiming the free gift is available to all that will believe because your son died for all. And we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Once again, we do thank you for your love and for your grace. In your name, amen. Amen.
Thank you. Questions, thanks, comments, Dave. Concerns? Great message. Jenny said, thanks. Great message. Oh, you're welcome. Did Mark Jenny. ever show up? Yeah, he's here. Oh, okay. How are you checking on him? Yeah, we stuck him in the back. Oh, my. I'm in the back. <laughs> oh, I'm. <laughs> we can show the audience. <laughs> <laughs> and Lori's there. Good morning, Lori. Hi. Hi, y'all. I got to go, go base at my